wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. For harmony is as precious as the anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head that ran down his beard and onto the border of his robe. Harmony is as refreshing as the dew from Mount Hermon that falls on the mountains of Zion. And there the Lord has pronounced his blessing, even life everlasting. The community of believers was one in heart and mind. None of them would say, this is mine about any of their possessions, but held everything in common. The apostles continued to bear powerful witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. An abundance of grace was at work among them all. There were no needy persons among them. Those who owned properties or houses would sell them, bring the proceeds from the sales, and place them in the care and under the authority of the apostles. Then it was distributed to anyone who was in need. Now, Dennis. Scripture reading, the epistle lesson, (laughs) is from John 1, verses 1 to 7. We saw him with our very own eyes. We gazed upon him and heard him speak. Our hands actually touched him, the one who was from the beginning, the living expression of God. This life giver was made visible and we have seen him. We testify to this truth. The eternal life giver lived face to face with the Father and has now dawned upon us. So we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard about this life giver so that we may share and enjoy this life together. For truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus, the anointed one. 
We are writing these things to you because we want to release to you our fullness of joy. This is the life-giving message we heard him share, and it's still ringing in our ears. We now repeat his words to you. God is pure light. You will never find even a trace of darkness in him. If we claim that we share life with him, but keep walking in the realm of darkness, we're fooling ourselves and not living the truth. But if we keep living in pure light that surrounds him, we share unbroken fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, continually cleanses us from all sin. Amen. Again, welcome to the University Church, 4747 Hill Avenue in Toledo, Ohio. We are grateful for everyone being here this second Sunday of Easter. We thank God for our liturgists and we, um, for those who are watching on YouTube and Facebook, we apologize for technical difficulties with the slides. <laughs> We are beginning a new sermon series, Life After Easter, Being the Church in a Messy World. I was meeting with a, uh, a fellow colleague um, here in um, Toledo of another denomination, and we were sharing or swapping what we were preaching. And when I told him my title, he said, oh, wait a minute, let me write that down. How many know we're living in a messy world? 
I mean, this work, I mean, as we look at the news on all platforms, we can perceive that the world is getting worse instead of better. As it, and especially as it relates to we as humanity relating to each other and God's creation. Whether we believe in global warming, whether we believe that we're polluting the earth to the point where we will not be here with all the plastics in the water and everything, we are in a messy world. Landfills are brimming. Gas is coming up from the landfills, polluting the air that we breathe and the groundwater. And don't let me start talking about the political climate, not just here in the United States, but around the world. It made me cry to see those um, humanitarian workers killed, trying to do what was right. You see, we are formed in God's image and told to subdue the earth and take care of it. How are we doing with that? It seems humanity has slipped in its duties. And that includes me and you. When the last time you picked up a piece of paper on the street in front of you, or did we just walk by it? When the last time we tried not to use plastic or styrofoam? My husband, no, I can't stand styrofoam. And I don't have plastic plates anywhere. No, I have two plastic cups for kids that come in my house. As we repent and turn back to God and God's ways, we, followers of Jesus, are commanded to be in fellowship with one another and with creation. We may not like those little bugs, nor the bear or the fox, but God created all for us to be in fellowship, helping one another. Let us pray. God of abundance, we are thankful for the beauty all around us. Weave us together in a life full of goodness and joy. Help us to move in harmony with one another and with all creation. Let us travel on your path towards release in your presence. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our sermon title, Walking in Fellowship. And it comes from the epistle lesson of 1 John. 1, 1 through 7. But I would like to read for, in your hearing again, 1 John 1, 1 through 4 from the New Revised Standard Version, updated edition. Thus it reads, We declare to you what was from the beginning and what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testify to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that your joy may be complete. The gospel writer, Apostle John, writes a pastoral letter to the new generation of believers, of Gentiles, so they will have assurance and confidence in God and in their faith. We may hear these words even now for us. First John was written to dispel doubts and to build assurance by presenting a clear picture of Jesus Christ. John knew the Christ. He had lived with him and had seen Jesus work. You remember John the beloved? He had to be the youngest one, so thus he might have been the, one, the last one left. 
John enjoyed the fellowship with the father and the son during his days living on the earth. He's probably writing this while he's on the Isle of Patmos. He explains in simple terms what it means to have fellowship with God. False teachers with different understanding of Jesus had entered into the assembly, denying the incarnation of Christ. Boy, we're hearing some of that doctrine now. John writes to correct the errors of the doctrine that these false teachers were teaching. So let us hear it again. In light of what we hear, there's, there's no incarnation. There's no atonement. There's no risen Savior. John begins his letter giving his credentials as an eyewitness of the incarnation and by stating his reason for writing this letter. John, the revelator, presents to us today that God is light, symbolizing absolute purity and holiness. And he explains to us this morning how we as believers and disciples of our risen Savior can walk in God's light and have fellowship with God through our faith in the risen Lord. John is showing us that whoever claims to live in Jesus, I need to slow down. Whoever claims to live in Jesus and Jesus dwells with them must walk spiritually and morally. Ooh, Jesus. Why the world is in a mess. Our morals have gone down the tubes. We must walk as Jesus walked. So what is walking? Walking is, means literally to travel on foot, yes. But figuratively, this morning, we are stating about one spiritual and moral journey. We are all on a path. And we're traveling this journey. Some of us alone and some in company, but we are walking. In the Bible days, foot, footpaths connected houses and villages. You know, now we got roads, but footpaths used to connect a house and villages. I remember growing up in the rural area, I'm going to say the country, in the rural areas, and we walked the path to grandmama's house. And then we would cross the field on the path to get to the auntie's house. And then if we needed to go to the neighbor, we'll follow the path through the little woods and get to the what? Neighbor's house. You better not go in people's yards now. Walking was tiring. We don't walk anymore. If we try to walk from here to the door, we say, oh, we can't walk the mall. And let's not even talk about having a prayer walk. What do you mean? I got to walk and pray? <laughs> During Bible days, walking was tiresome. It was hot work, hot work, which was why the law, the law, Moses, limited travel on the Sabbath because it was work. Why do you think we, if they, the, our doctors want us to walk because it's good exercise, but then, then walking wasn't exercise, it was a mode of transportation. In the Old Testament, there are many instances of the word walking. The psalmist in Psalm 66, 9 fears that his feet will slip. Therefore, he appreciates that God's word is a light unto his path. In Deuteronomy 8, 6, the writer speaks of those who believe walking in God's way, God's commands become a road that gets us where we need to go in life itself. And it was dangerous to step anywhere else. The hymn writer writes the hymn, Walking the King. 
way. In the New Testament, Paul reminds the congregation in Colossae to not walk as, as they once did in the ways determined by man's earthly sin nature. If we walk as Jesus did, we will live in fellowship with the Father through our faith in Jesus as the risen Christ. This is what makes us Easter people. You should get excited that if somebody call you an Easter person. Yeah, I'm an Easter person. I believe in the risen Savior, and I'm walking as he did, in power and authority. Our faith in Jesus being raised from the dead, or rising from the dead, and ascending to the Father, and sending the Holy Spirit back to us, connects us to Jesus' walk. And it connects us to the heavenly realm, which comes and connects us back to earth and one another. Walking as Jesus brings us into fellowship with God. Fellowship, quantania in the Greek. There is no exact English word equivalent for quantania. It's more than socializing. So can, can I just put a pause right there and go on my soapbox? You are not having fellowship because you're drinking coffee and eating donuts. <laughs> you are social, say that word with me, socializing. So if I don't have coffee and juice over there, you still should be fel uh -oh. fellowshipping whether you have a cup of coffee or drink of tea or some grapes. Thank you, Tim, for the grape. That's not quantania. Stop saying I'm having fellowship after worship. No. You socializing. And then, I, and please stop saying, well, if we don't have fellowship because we don't see each other, go to Starbucks. <laughs> if you want to see each other in between Sunday to Sunday, hey, y'all, we're going to Reynolds Diner after church and we're going to socialize. But when we truly, come on, but when we truly have fellowship, it means holding lives in common. This is done through spiritual, social, and material generosity towards one another. It is a common sharing of the grace and of the blessings of God in community. So if you really want to have true fellowship after worship, you will talk about how God has touched you during the worship experience. Amen. You will share with the neighbor that's in the sanctuary, hey, what did God say to you while we were listening to the songs or how we were listening to the prayer or the preached word? That's... <laughs> Because then you're sharing the grace and the blessings of God. And you still could drink coffee and eat grapes. <laughs> so my question is, when the last time you really truly fellowshiped with one another? Woo! Do not throw rotten oranges and rotten apples or tomatoes at me. Those online. Yes, this is hard. It's tight, but it's right. You see, when we truly fellowship, we gain strength and support and protection from the world's woes when we are in true fellowship. So you could be having an anxiety attack about what you saw on the news, and you get to come together with those that are of the part of the body of Christ, and they can give you support 
and encouragement and say, hey, God is in control or whatever they need to say to what? Build you up. Apostle John's writings let us know that when we are in fellowship, we start with the father and the son. And then we can walk in fellowship with creation. Can't walk with each other until you walk with the father because in our human nature, we don't get along so well. You're going to, you, mm, I'm going to say a bad word. You're going to make me mad. I'm going to offend you because of something inside of me going to say something that you don't like or that I don't like how you live or I don't like your political views or I don't like, and you put dot, 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 dot. Then we're going to what? Separate. Have you seen our political system? Have you seen the the the, the Congress and the Senate, they're not walking in fellowship because they, why? Because the father is not in between them. Because when they walk with father and the son, they can walk with each other even in different opinions. I know this sounds like not a churchy, preachy thing, but it's right. To walk in fellowship means that each one of us is prepared to face anything the devil might throw at us while we are out in the world. I was asked by a person be not named, is that they say, what does it mean to be in the world but not part of the world? To be in the world. We live here, but we're not part because we are in fellowship with God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. The quality of koinonia is in direct correlation to our relationship with God. If we have not set aside sacred space to become knowledgeable and intimate with the God our deity until the point that God becomes not just a deity on a hill, but God becomes family. We can't grow in Quantania. Because in, in your home, I don't know about you, but my parents had the last word. Now, I grew up as an only child, so, but I know when I got with my cousins and friends, we would fight. Anybody? Whether you had brothers and sisters or cousins or, or friends in the community, somebody going to say something and you're going to get mad. But wait till the parent walks out. I don't know, care which parent it was or which guardian, and they said, stop. Everybody Freud. And said, y'all better get it right. My fa you better get it right. Y'all better hug each other. Any anybody? You better tell her, you better tell her you sorry. And you're gonna make sure you sorry. Cause I want to see sorry on your face. Oh, see, so you had to be grow up in a black black house. I'm you it may not been in your in your community, but my community. You better you better straighten up your face, and you better get it right, and you better tell them you're sorry. Now go hug them. That's your cousin. That's your brother. That's your sister. That's your that's your neighbor. That's your cousin, and you're not even related by blood. You see. God wants us to grow up. God calls us to grow to maturity in the body of Christ. Many of us are still functioning as 10-year-olds and 12-year-olds and 18-year-olds in our mental and emotional stance. Congress, that last fight they had, I, just, I thought there was a bunch of high school kids 
on the playground. Anybody else? With them fight, what they had in that last fight, the one's gonna ask the other one outside. I thought it, I'd really say, well, that's high school kids out there. They weren't grown, mature adults. I've been in a church, people, in a board meeting where a man asked a woman outside to fight. I wanted to know where the maturity was. So the next time we had meetings, I brought a candle, I brought communion. I said, now let's see what you're going to do in front of Jesus for real. <laughs> and then I made them pass the candle to each other and say, I am sorry, godly sorry that if I caused you any pain. But they didn't like that too much. But I bet you I never had anybody else talking about going to invite somebody out to fight. You either going to be a Christian and a disciple or you're not. And if you're not going to be one, this is not the right place for you. And you shouldn't be a leader. Because your heart's not right. And you're not walking in fellowship. Say that word with me. Fellowship. This is a part one. I just want you to know. This is part one. I start, so Diane, we, 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 we still use the same ones. Because when I got into this, I said, oh, I can't just go fly through this. God wants us to mature in the body of Christ. We are called to attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Ephesians 4, Paul writes in 13 through in verses 15 and 16, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to, what is that word? Everybody say that word with me maturity to the measure of the full stature of Christ. But speaking the truth in love, that doesn't mean we just go along with your mess. Uh-huh. May grow up. Say, somebody say grow up. Uh-huh. Turn, I know this is, I, I know I am not in my normal regular black church, but I need you to turn to each other. Come on, turn to them. I know it's uncomfortable. And tell them to grow up. Online, grow up <laughs> in all things unto him who is the head. Did anybody know that you were not totally in control? Who is the head of the church? Christ. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by whatever joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share. Oh, no, I'm just supposed to come and sit in the chair. Or, oh, I'm just supposed to sit at home on a couch. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to go nowhere. Well, no, no, no. If you're part of the body of church, according to the effective working by which every part does its share. I want you to point to yourself. I have a share Come on, point to yourself. I have a share of work to do. In the body and in this church, this congregation. Yeah, come on here. Woo. Y'all think all of this is free and you don't want to do anything. No, privilege went out the door. Why? So we keep reading. Why? Because it causes growth of the body for the edific- edifying of itself in love. I need to say that again. I'm reading scripture. Then you get mad with me, but Paul wrote this. Why? Every part does its share. Why? Because it causes growth. It's fertilizer for the body. So that we can edify the body in love. That's in compassion. Woo. And you say you're having fellowship 
after church? <laughs> Are you causing the person that you're drinking coffee with to grow by drinking that coffee? Ooh, this is some good. I'm good. I like it. I don't care. I don't know about you, but I like this. So in conclusion, I, I'm, I only can give you so much today. I know. <laughs> this is some good food, but if you eat too much, you'll get sick. You get, yeah, I'm full right now and I'm preaching. I'm just saying. Because <laughs> I'm challenging myself. Do I even have fellowship with you? Have we sat down? Well, most of them I have tried. But have we sat down and discussed the things of God in your life? Next question, have you even let me come to your house to do it? Uh-oh. And maybe not your house. You know, it could be Walmart. I don't know. <laughs> but have we had that conversation? I've, I, everyone in here, I've had, that con I've had a conversation to get to know you. But have you had a conversation to get to know me? Ooh. See, true fellowship is, is it's a two-way street. Because we're all on the same, what, path to grow up in God. Because there goes some places in me is not mature. You come at me wrong, I will act like a child. Anybody? Yeah. So in conclusion, walking in fellowship means walking in harmony. Harmony with God and harmony with each other. Walking in fellowship is walking in agreement with God's ways and commands. It is having things in common. We all have difference, but then we also must find those things that make us one. Those things we have in common. Walking in fellowship is based on us walking in the light of God. We want to be children of light, or do we? Or do we like walking in bitterness and unbelief and doubt, that's darkness. Fellowship is maintained with God as we continue walking in the light God reveals to us. You haven't seen all the light yet. God reveals. It's like making music. I'm going to ask my, my two people to come up to the podium. Tim, I need a I'm, you, you don't know what I'm going to ask you, but in a musical score, everyone must not only play the correct notes, but they also must be playing in the same key. <laughs> so... I want you to play, I want, okay, I know Danielle can do this. Tim, I just want you to play um, a C chord. Okay, now what, what does a C chord start with? With C, right? And what chord, you're in a C chord. Now I want you to sing the same note in, a, in a, another chord, in another key. Okay, so now I want y'all to sing it, do it in the same key. Oh, not that, same key. <laughs> C. He was in a C, kick, a C key and you were in the key of D. Just one step away. Just one step away. Not, not even big step. And you could hear the difference. Ooh, there you, go. you, you got it. There you go, Tim. <laughs> Many of us in the body of Christ, just stand right there. Many of us in the body of Christ are like, hit that note again that you just did before that going to Yeah, we walking. God is 
in the key of C. Give me a key of C. Now go back where you went before. Go to that other one that you did, that last one you did. Yeah, God is down, yeah, and we down there. We up there. And when that happens, then we too, as individuals, are off. And we don't sound well. That's what's happening with our world today. All the ones that say they are Christians and they're fighting. Because one is in the key of C and the other's in the key of D. And God, give me a key of G. And God is there working, saving. of us are called to be playing in the same key with God's melodious sound that surrounds us with the birds chirping and the crickets cricketing and the grass blowing in the breeze and we're supposed to be at one that we sway with what God is singing through the heavenly when we do that, we can be at one with each other. So I invite you today, hit that key again. I ask you to find your key that God is in and help us to find that we may walk in that key of life in Jesus' name. Until next Sunday, we're going to see what John says about how we get there. Amen and amen. Thank you, Tim. You can just sit down right there if you want. So I invite you today. Isn't this a beautiful picture? Do you notice that the girl's dress becomes the field of flowers? That's, walk, that's in oneness. And the music of God's sound is in the air with the trees and the water. That's harmony. I wish Holly was here, but we're going to try to do harmony later. But because I, I want you to hear the harmony in song. We have four, in the Methodist church, we always have four part harmony. If you look at the hymns, they are written in four part harmony. Can we do a soprano? Yeah. 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 Um, you want me to do? Uh, uh, you want me that one? Uh, what is that? What song are we going to talk about? I think that's a G. G. I think so. You want to do a C, C, and I'll do G. Okay. Okay. What am I do? You C. Do, you do C. C. about God doing the C and we doing the G. And we have melodious melody as the body of Christ. So I invite you today to the table which is spread. I invite you to come and be in harmony through the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup that we become one with the Father, as Jesus is one with the Father, and we become one with each other. So to do that, I call you to a prayer of confession. I invite you to come and be one with each other. We ask you to now to come. Think about where you, God was singing a G and you decided to sing an F in E minor. Ain't God good? God, God can just work that stuff. 
So if I ask you now to just pray in silence where you know you have gotten off key with God or with family members, with neighbors, or even with yourself. Let us pray together in unison. Everyone, God of grace and mercy, we want to continue singing the alleluias of Easter, but there are days we just don't feel like singing. Sometimes we lock ourselves away, fearful of what has happened or what the day may bring. Sometimes we allow our doubts to overwhelm our faith. Sometimes we forget about the needs of our neighbors because we are so focused on ourselves. Forgive us, draw us back to you and to one another. Help us walk in your love and light that others may see in us the love and presence of the risen Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, siblings in Christ, Jesus promises if you, are forg if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. Receive the hope and promise of this good news, for forgiveness is ours when we forgive one another. Everyone, thanks be to God. The great thanksgiving for the Easter season. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Creator God, you revealed to us your creation on earth. The waters flowed and the winds blew. You set the cosmos into motion and created live beings. You gave life to the plants and the sea creatures and the land animals. You put into flight the birds and insects, and you made people to walk on the ground. You blessed us all and called us good. But when our love failed and we turned away, you revealed a love for your people in all of creation that never ends. And so we praise you with all the company of saints and sinners singing, but we're going to say, our unending hymn, everyone. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You continue to reveal your love for us in your son, Jesus, who came to live among us and moved as human on this earth. When he dined with his friends just before he was to be executed, he reminded them of your love revealed in the gifts of bread and wine before them on the table. He took the bread in his hands, gave thanks to you, broke it, and shared it with his friends, saying the familiar words, take. Eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, again gave thanks to you, and shared it with all who gathered, reminding them, drink this, all of you. This is the cup of my new covenant with you. For the forgiveness of sins, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Together we proclaim the mystery of faith, everyone. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Still creating spirit, pour out on these and those who gathered here and on these gifts from the field and bread and juice. As we receive them into our body, make us your body. Unite us with those who have come before us in your kingdom and with those who will come after us now and always. Amen. And now with the conference of children of God, let us pray the pattern of prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Because there is one body. So we ask those to come and let us share. 